Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar on lagoon wastewater treatment systems, what they are and what they are not. My name is Kristen Crew from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Before we begin, we're going to go over a few logistics and then we can get started. During the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. We will be saving your questions for a facilitated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, you will receive a follow-up email that includes a link to the recording and other information that you may need. You can also download the slides from today in the Handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar has not been submitted for pre-approval of continuing education credits, but eligible attendees will receive a certificate of attendance for their personal record. To receive a certificate for the session, you must attend for the entire session and register and attend individually using your real name and unique email address. Certificates will be sent via email within 30 days of the webinar date. If you have questions or need assistance, please contact smallsystems at syr.edu. Now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small wastewater, water systems in the all US states and territories through our building technical, managerial, and finance capacity programs. If your community or utility needs assistance with drinking water or wastewater system management, please feel free to contact us through our request form, which I will be sharing shortly in the chat. On that note, we can get started. I would like to introduce our presenter for the day, Mike Tate. He is a project associate from the Wichita State University Environmental Finance Center. And before I pass it over to Mike, I'm going to drop our first poll. Where are you employed? All right, get those answers in. I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, Mike, it looks like most people are here from the state and federal government, about 46% after that consulting, and then we have about 17% here from local government. 5% from industry and 11% are from other. I'm gonna pass it right over to you. Okay, let's make sure I get my right screen here. Can you, Kristen, do you see my first slide? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. Well, we'll get yeah. started then. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about myself, and you'll probably see some of my my biases come out during the talk. But I also, uh, before working with Wichita State, uh, spent a little over 30 years with the state of Kansas, worked in uh, mostly the wastewater side of the programs. but. Ultimately, before I retired, was the head of all water programs. So have a little drinking water, wastewater, CAFO, underground injection, uh, lots of different areas that I worked for. And then after that, I uh, I worked for EPA for almost six years before I retired there. Um, so what I want to talk about is something, a topic I have a lot of passion for, and that's lagoons. And it's just a little overview here of you know you know what we're going to talk about today what they are uh where and why they're used how they work uh treatment performance uh that'll be from a study i did when i worked with the state of kansas uh do lagoons have a future uh there's a lot of people questioning lagoons now because they have trouble meeting ammonia criteria in a lot of places 
uh, and nutrients may be an issue for them too. But uh, spoiler alert, I am unabashedly a proponent for lagoons in the right places, which is particularly small communities. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, to make sure they do have that future, some good O&M practices and what you should do to, to make sure that uh, your lagoon does have a future. So, let's see here. Um, and some of these presentations before, some people have, have mentioned uh, they'd like to see acronyms and it's uh, unfortunate, I think, necessity when you work in a technical field that there are quite a few acronyms there. So. As Kristen pointed out, you can download my slide handouts. I uh, suggest that you do that. If you even wanted to have it running, you could refer back to this slide that uh, explains all the acronyms that uh, hopefully that uh, I'll be using uh, throughout the presentation. But anyway, let's talk about lagoons. And some people may have heard them called something else. Of course, a lagoon. Some people call them a sewer lagoon. Some call them a waste stabilization pond. That was kind of the name denoted. I, typically, uh, when the Clean Water Act came out, uh, an EPA referred to them as that. It's a long title for me. I'll say lagoon uh, in most of my talks today and wastewater treatment ponds. And uh, I also had a guy refer to it as a hole in the ground. And you can tell why that operator felt like it was a hole in the ground. This is his pond. Uh, fence post basically coming out of the ground, way overgrown. You couldn't tell it was a, a treatment lagoon, probably from just a, a livestock pond. Uh, we prefer for them to look a little more like this one over here on the right side of the screen. And just to give you some sense of, of perception of what this, this is, this is a 14 acre lagoon system uh in kansas so to me what lagoons are they're the simplest form of secondary wastewater treatment uh, that exists and they've been used in the united states for municipal type purposes since the 1940s basically then went until the 60s and 70s people really tried to to study them and put some parameters around them on how they should be built and operated to give uh, uh, best quality treatment. And a lot of that was driven because of the secondary treatment rule uh, and the federal regulations that came along with uh, the Clean Water Act. So uh, lagoons do, they're designed to provide secondary treatment at a really low capital and operation and maintenance cost. Uh, they do, you know, the secondary treatment, which is BOD and total suspended solids reduction. And the pH of the discharge, those are really the three things in the secondary treatment rule. And, but lagoons have had a special carve out, uh, not initially, but later on in the secondary treatment rule that allowed lagoons to have some slightly higher limits. Uh, they can typically have BOD in the effluent of 45 milligrams per liter monthly average as opposed to 30 for most other processes. They can have higher TSS limits in the effluent. And that depends on analyses that were done from the states back in the, I think the 70s and 80s, uh, where they would look and see, you know, well, what do we typically see from our well-maintained lagoons and submitted that to EPA for approval. And so currently those uh, solids numbers range from 37 to 120 milligrams per liter as opposed to the 30 milligrams per liter most other processes have to meet. They also uh, have BOD and TSS percent removals, you know, a lot of permits, so you gotta have 85% removal. Well, because of allowing that higher effluent concentration from lagoons, the percent removal is knocked down to 65% for those. And pH, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, is, you know, you can, as, an, as a lagoon owner, you might be able to request uh, no or relaxed pH limits because there's a provision in secondary treatment that says if you're not adding acids or bases, chemicals, you know, to your treatment process or you don't have industries that are adding those kinds of things, then you may not need to meet that uh, 
pH requirement that's discussed in secondary treatment. So uh, biggest, broadest, when we talk about the types of lagoons, probably the broadest breakdown that I see is whether you have a discharging lagoon or what I call a, a non-discharging lagoon. You know, discharging lagoons treat the wastewater and the effluent is discharged to a surface water, like a stream or a river. And out of that, some of the water also evaporates or seeps into the ground. And if they do discharge to the surface, then they're required to have an NPDES permit, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit, which is going to have a lot of conditions on it. It's going to have uh, treatment limits uh, that you're required to meet, et cetera. Then you can have non-discharging lagoons, and these are my favorite, you know, of lagoons because they don't discharge to a river or stream, and because of that, they really don't need an NPDES permit. Some states may require it. Other states may have their own permitting program they refer to as just a state-only permit instead of an NPDES permit, which is essentially a joint state and EPA permit. Uh, but with non-discharging, you have to count on water evaporating from the pond, seeping into the ground, or reuse through irrigation. And if you can get all those things to balance out, then you don't have a discharge of the wastewater. And I think those are the, the best of the best. So the uh, next thing is, you know, people sometimes ask, you know, well, it's called a system. Why is it called a lagoon system? Well, it's really because we prefer for them to be built with multiple cells, and each cell is a part of that lagoon system that has a specific function, and we'll get into talking about what those are later. The next kind of cut on lagoons when we talk about the after discharging and non-discharging is, are they aerated? Do you mechanically provide air to that lagoon? And it kind of, a couple of ways you can do that. You can have these surface type aerators that mix the water around and throw oxygen into the air. Uh, used to you hear a lot of people call those an egg beater. Show you a picture as to why that is. Uh, Typically now, I think you generally see mostly uh, diffused aeration in those ponds. You have the diffusers at the bottom of the ponds, which <clears throat> then provide air uh, to the bacteria in the ponds that treat the wastewater. You can have an anaerobic pond. You rarely, rarely see those in a municipality, though, or one of these publicly owned treatment works. Uh, they generally are used to treat industrial waste. We see them a lot in my part of the country, which is Kansas and the central part of the US uh, for meat packing plants where they have a very high, high BOD uh, in their wastewater coming in, typically in the thousands uh, of milligrams per liter and an anaerobic lagoon tends to be the best way to knock that down to a reasonable level for a, an aerated process to treat. But really all they do is just have a seal on the top of the lagoon somehow. Uh, they do that and to keep the air out and it's treated by anaerobic bacteria, which you know require no air. And then there's a little sludge buildup in those, actually quite a bit of sludge buildup. Uh, interesting thing, if you've never seen one of these at a meat packer, generally what they do is they let fat out of the process come to the top of the lagoon and it floats on the top of the lagoon and eventually forms a seal. Other ways of doing that are plastic liners uh, to seal out that lagoon. The most common where I'm from is a facultative lagoon. And these are the, I call the natural process lagoons is, uh, they're called facultative because they got kind of three zones in them. And aerobic zone in the top where there's a lot of oxygen that does a lot of the treatment, supplies bacteria to treat the wastewater. And again, at the bottom, you have an anaerobic zone where sludge builds up and that anaerobic action treats the sludge to a degree and reduces its volume and, and uh, makes it a little bit more palatable. And then in between those two zones, you have a facultative zone where you have bacteria who can either use oxygen or not use so much oxygen called facultative bacteria. 
uh, that live in that zone, and they're all providing treatment of uh, one form or another. But here's kind of pictures of uh, what we're talking about. This is when I talked about that surface aerator, egg beater type treatment. You can see that it's just really kicking up the water in that lagoon and spraying it. And you get some pretty interesting looks in the winter when uh, water begins to freeze that's thrown up in the air there. Uh, you also now uh, more likely have these diffused aerator lagoons, and you can see these strings of uh, headers that have these aerators coming off of them in this lagoon. Uh, sometimes you'll get what's called a partially aerated lagoon, and some people do those when a facultative lagoon is, is somewhat failing uh, for various reasons, and they'll throw in a few aerators just to provide a little more oxygen not so much uh, complete mixing and all that you might see in a fully aerated lagoon. And then here's this rare instance of a city that has an anaerobic lagoon and aerobic lagoons. And I'm gonna blow that up a little bit. This cell in front, hopefully you can see on your screen, has a plastic liner over the top of it. And so that has an aerated lagoon. And the reason for that is, this is Dodge City, Kansas, and, and uh, they take a lot of high strength uh, wastewater from meat packers. And so that waste is anaerobically treated and that generates methane. And they had recently then built this gas plant here that takes that methane gas and cleans it up and essentially then can substitute for natural gas. In the back then are really facultative ponds that can hold that water afterwards, as well as the domestic water that comes in. And then the other, I think, really interesting thing about this facility is then they irrigate all of the wastewater out of these uh, lagoons on uh, corn crops. So where and why uh, do we usually use lagoons? Well, it's typically in small communities. EPA put out a study that if you haven't looked at and you're interested in lagoons, I would really consider uh, reading. Uh, here's, you can Google that and find that uh, link to it. It just came out last May. I had a little bit to do with that. Uh, and I think it's, it's a great piece of work. The woman who put it together from EPA just did a stellar job because there really wasn't much information about lagoons. People needed to get a handle on, well, how many of these things are there? and Where are they at? And why are they used? And none of that really existed out there in the literature. So she did a great job in putting all of that together. And what uh, she found out in that study is the median population that served uh, by lagoons, 793 people. And if you look at the less than 1,000 population, uh, that's 58% uh, of the lagoons are serving less than a thousand people. So that's why I say that's small communities where those things are used. And one thing I always want you to remember as you think about this that people sometimes forget is that it's not 793 people or a thousand people who are paying the bills if these things have to be replaced and a mechanical plant put in it's ratepayers, and pretty much across the nation, you can see from the census data, there's can estimate two and a half people per household, and so that means if you get a thousand population, you only got about 400 ratepayers, okay, to uh, to uh, pick up the cost for that. And if you look at the graph that came out of that, each of these bars is about 300, you know, people. So you can see that thousand population, and that most of those lagoons are down in that range. There are some that go up, a few, and we can debate whether or not those really ought to be used for those larger populations. I tend to think uh, after a few thousand people, probably not, but uh, that's a, a topic for another day. And so why are they used in these small communities? Well, as I said before, they've got a low capital cost. And it's a low capital cost as long as land is cheap because they do tend to take quite a bit of land. Um, but they have, I think, a, a fabulous cost to performance ratio. The cost is pretty low 
and the performance is actually quite good if they're well designed and operated. They're low tech, so they require minimal operator education. Uh, and that, you know, you should understand is not to say anything about the quality of the people who are out running those lagoon. It's just in these small towns, when you have a town this size, the person who is responsible for sewers is probably doing sewer work, wastewater work, drinking water work, maybe doing uh, natural gas, maybe doing sanitation, maybe working on streets too. Uh, they are stressed, uh, they do a lot of different things, and so you can't expect them to have, you know, the degree and just focus on wastewater that you would expect of a larger community. And then they typically have low operation and maintenance costs too. So uh, again, referencing this study, uh, it's a pretty interesting picture as to where lagoons are. And this was really kind of uh, interesting exercise to try to do is that uh, in EPA's uh, national databases, they don't keep track of treatment type. And actually, many states don't keep track of treatment type, but some states do. So they asked states if they could to provide data on uh, lagoon facilities in their states. And it was interesting to see the ones who could pull up the data and say, sure, you know, here's what we've got. We've got facultative, we've got aerated lagoons, and some of them just maybe gave you lagoons, but it wasn't specified as to what type it was. But if you look here, you know, I told you that I worked in the central part of the country, EPA Region 7, and we're pretty much inundated with lagoons here. I worked in Kansas, and there's a lot of lagoons there. But you tend to see a lot of that through the central plains uh, uh, of the U.S., that there's a lot of those lagoons. And then if you look at the density of where those lagoons are in each state, it's a it's pretty telling story uh, as to how many of those things that are out there. Uh, I, you don't really see much white here <laughs> in Iowa. Uh, that they're in somebody's pretty close to a lagoon at some point. And what the study came out to is about 30% of POTWs, the publicly owned treatment works, municipal treatment facilities, if you will, are lagoons. I tend to think if you would have data from every state, if every state had been able to provide data, you would find that I think it could be upwards of 40% of what I would call the wastewater treatment fleet in the US is uh, lagoons. But just to give you an idea, I said working out here in my part of the country, look at Iowa's really good about publishing their data on wastewater treatment facilities and what they have in the state. And they're sitting at about 63% lagoons compared to other types of treatment. And then Kansas, where I worked for a long time, is about 74% lagoons. And that's uh, really um, again, while I, why I'm a real supporter, because why I said nationally that study showed the median size population with a lagoon was 793 people in Kansas. That's about 400, 420 people or 175 rate payers. So it even gets smaller in terms of the population that has to pay for that infrastructure. So again, where and why they are used, the pros, it's, they're cost effective. If land's cheap, uh, you know, it, they're pretty easy to build and maintain. Uh, they don't need 24 seven oversight, you know, which we've talked about before, not having to have highly trained staff because you typically have staff in those small communities that are doing lots of different things, keeping lots of, lots of balls in the air, if you will. Sorry about that. Uh, they're low energy use, particularly if you're a facultative lagoon, uh, you're not pumping oxygen in, uh, so you're not using a whole lot of energy on those. The o and ms pretty easy. Um, you know, it's it's occasionally has some things to do, but it's not like trying to maintain a mechanical plant, an activated sludge plant. Uh, they're good at handling a wide range of flows if you've got some infiltration inflow issues or you have seasonal high flows, you're good at doing that. 
I'll show you some data again that, that I had uh, put together uh, in a study I did on reducing nutrients. They actually do a pretty darn good job of reducing nutrients, which is really an important topic. I think probably the most important problem we have in terms of water quality in the US today. And they're also pretty good at removing pathogens. So the cons you would have though in building lagoons is that they do require more land. So if you're landlocked or land's expensive, um, they may not be your best choice. <clears throat> they do have lower treatment efficiency in the cold and that's particularly for ammonia. You'll see that, that the, the quality of ammonia treatment in the winter months tends to go down. Uh, you can have odor. If any of you out there are pond operators, uh, you probably have had pond turnover at some point where temperatures change and your water at the bottom turns over to the top. And so you've got that anaerobic, that sludge down there. And when it turns over, you get that smelly layer on the top for a few days to a week. And people tend not to like that. Uh, they aren't the best at removing toxics. Uh, the effluents generally can going to contain some algae. You may have some little green in your streams down below the discharge, but that's part of the rationale for the alternative total suspended solids limit I talked about. And then desludging is costly. But the good part about that is you only have to do it once every 20 years or so. And I think some good news is EPA and I confirmed it yesterday on a call I was on with the state revolving loan fund folks at EPA is that they're now, it looks like if your state allows it, EPA would allow uh, state revolving loan fund monies to be used for desledging. It used to be considered a maintenance operation and, and those aren't funded by SRF, but now it's being viewed differently that, you know, since it's only once every 15 to 20 years, um, it could be funded. So let's talk about how lagoons work. And when I talk about work, I'm going to talk about well-designed and maintained lagoons. They do reduce BOD, solids, ammonia, bacteria, nutrients. Improperly designed ones uh, or improperly maintained ones do not, and they can be human health problems and they can cause environmental problems. But when we're looking at uh, designs of a lagoon, they're really, sometimes you don't get the, the picture of them unless you've seen one empty and see how it's built, is they're really these very, very shallow uh, basins, uh, typically with an operating depth. If we're looking here at the facultative lagoons versus the aerated lagoons, you know, this may only be a five foot operating depth in a facultative lagoon. Uh, you want a little freeboard, that's, you know, in case something happens, lines gets plugged, you have flooding, something, you want to have a little space for the water to encroach up in there, that's generally two to three feet. Uh, you have very shallow slopes so that if they are just soil and grass, they don't slough off in there. Uh, they can maintain their integrity and those are usually at a three to one slope on those things. Nice to have an eight foot top section on your dike so you can run a mower down there, you can run a pickup out there if you gotta drive around uh, your lagoons and do some maintenance there, uh, or just observation of them. Uh, now on an aerated lagoon, uh, another important design characteristic is this loading, what's called the loading, the pounds of VOD per acre per day you can apply to a lagoon and whether it's a, what we call a controlled discharge, where you just discharge, you know, a few weeks or a month a year, or a facultative lagoon is pretty low loading. It says 15 to 35 uh, pounds of BOD per acre. An aerated, you can put 50 to 100 pounds per acre. And so that means it can be a much smaller footprint for that aerated lagoon. Detention time. 90 to 100 days for a facultative lagoon, for a controlled discharge lagoon, you're probably talking 80 to 170, aerated, or 180 to 270, excuse me. Uh, aerated, you're talking 10 to 30 uh, days of detention, and again, with deeper cells. 
now the most important thing to me in designing these and making sure they work is having the proper amount of detention time and we're going to come back to that two or three more times in the rest of this talk and talk about the importance of that detention time and again how they look it, you know when somebody designs one of those they need to look at the detention time on it you got to look at what's coming into the pond. Well, you got wastewater coming in and you got precipitation coming in. And then what do you have going out? Well, you've got evaporation going out and you may have seepage going out through the bottom liner. And then you have your discharge. And so when we're looking at what comes in, if you don't have better data uh, from uh, your water utility, you can pretty much assume 100 gallons per person per day. Uh, precipitation data you can get from National Weather Service. Evaporation, hopefully you can get from the Weather Service, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, your state climatologist, what have you to look at evaporation, or you can conduct what's called a pan test at the site. Pan you set out, you measure evaporation. It's just those pans are also very shallow, kind of different dimensions than a pond. So they have correction factors you have to use to get the right amount of evaporation. And then seepage is regulated by the state. And I've seen anywhere from zero inches of seepage allowed to a quarter inch of seepage per day. And that generally uh, has to do with depth to groundwater. So you don't necessarily contaminate that groundwater. But let's get back to the zero to quarter of an inch. If you have a quarter of an inch a day on an acre, that's like 7,000 gallons per acre per day. And if you go to that 100 gallon per capita, that's like 70 people. The waste of 70 people is allowed to seep through the bottom of that lagoon. And one of the very first things I did uh, when I, I worked for the state of Kansas, I came in as a bunch of these lagoons had been decided, designed to be non-discharge. And when within a couple of years, they were always coming in and saying, we got a discharge, we got a discharge, we can't hold the water. So I was assigned to try to figure out why that was and what it really turned out to be in most cases was the engineer just designed for a quarter inch of seepage a day, uh, but that didn't necessarily get passed on to the contractor who's out there, you know, excavating, putting clay in and compacting it just as tight as he can. And so it turned out that while the design allowed for a quarter of an inch a day, the seepage was a whole lot less. But if again you can balance all that stuff out wastewater precipitation minus seepage and evaporation gets down to zero then likely you're not going to need an NPDES permit you might have to have a state permit but that can uh, keep you from having to do monitoring sampling a whole slew of other things that might come along with your permit and one other thing you can think about when you're looking at maybe trying to go non-discharge is the reuse component. Can you shut the discharge off and reuse it? And in you know smaller rural communities, I've seen reuse go to a lot of things. Uh, golf courses uh, tend to be quite popular. Um, seen baseball and softball fields and sometimes it's just such a little amount of water that has to be pulled down to keep these things from discharging that some people have been able to do uh, just watering their outside dikes of their lagoons uh, to keep that water balance but if you do use it on things like ball fields and golf courses you really ought to go to some special precautions uh, in kansas we would always have the uh, the golf courses add additional chlorination uh, to the water before it's uh, put on the course, uh, put on the scorecards that the course has been watered with uh, reused wastewater. So probably don't stick a golf tee in your mouth if you pick it up out of the ground, uh, things like that. Uh, so there ought to be special precautions made if you are reusing this wastewater in places where the public uh, has access. Again, on the design, facultative lagoons tend to be multiple cells, preferably more than three, splitting the primary and to secondary uh, cell size about 60-40, where you get most of the treatment in the first cell with some additional in the second, and pretty much settling and polishing in the third cell. 
And if the first two cells uh, then should be pumped in parallel or series, which we'll get to later what that means. And then if you have one of these controlled discharges where you're trying to just discharge it maybe a few weeks a year when it's least impactful to the environment, then your first two cells have basically equal treatment volume with a third cell that's as big as both of those combined for polishing. Aerated lagoons, multiple cells, again, you want more than three. Figure and detention time, you have to look at how much BOD you want to remove. And you look at these coefficients that are out there, it's somewhat an empirical calculation to then calculate how much detention time you need in that aerated lagoon to uh, fully provide treatment. And then second cells are, are partially aerated, may not be aerated at all. And third cells are used for polishing. So when we look at an aerated lagoon, and this is the one cell that I showed you earlier, you'll notice that you know you can always tell if you're looking at an aerial, this is the first cell, second, third, and fourth. Well, why is that? Well, you have the most intense aeration in the first cell. You have about half of that in the second cell, even less in the third cell, and then it probably transfers over right here, and you've got some aerators here, and water probably flows down here to be discharged. So when you have those, it tend tends to be a tapering of aeration as you go through the system. Okay, now I told you earlier, I thought that detention time was the most important design specification. And for at least the, what was it, uh, 14 or 19 percent of municipal folks, probably some of those are operators, they've had on an exam before, you know, the formula for detention time is the volume of the system, so many million gallons in those lagoons, divided by the flow rate in million gallons per day. Divide the volume by the flow rate, that gives you how many days of detention you have. So if the volume gets decreased somehow, then that's gonna shorten your detention time, right? Because you're dividing by a smaller number there. And how does that happen? Well, it tends to be mostly by sludge buildup. If you have sludge buildup in the bottom of the lagoon, uh, that takes away uh, volume for water. So periodically you're gonna have to desludge lagoons. Short circuiting, and I say that's kind of a volume loss in actuality. Uh, what it means is that a drop of water entering the lagoon doesn't fully utilize, doesn't travel all the way around that lagoon system. It short circuits and uh, then doesn't get the full treatment time in the lagoon. And I said it's, I think it's the most important. EPA has a manual out there that's called their Lagoon Design Manual. And uh, they say it's it's so important. They actually put this statement in twice, which I'm not sure if was intentional or true, but I hope it was intentional because it says short circuiting is the greatest deterrent to a consistent pond performance. Importance of hydraulic design of a lagoon or a pond system cannot be overemphasized. And totally agree with them there. It's 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 all about detention time. So what is short circuiting? Well, that's if you had your pond designed and say your influent comes in here and your transfer structure to your second pond is right here, this water can just go here real quick. It may not utilize all of this volume of pond down here, so you don't get that full time in the pond. Same thing here and same thing here. And so what a lot of people have done, uh, if they have that, is they'll put in what are called curtains. It's usually a high density uh, plastic that will go in there that's stretched across the lagoon. It'll have an opening in it. So the water flows in and gets forced down to this end of the lagoon before it transfers over and back up. Same way for each of those other cells. Uh, the best way is to hopefully have it designed to where you don't short circuit to begin with and you have those uh, uh, transfer boxes, you know, at uh, far apart from one another. So again, back to how they work, and I told you about this natural process of facultative lagoons, which I love. Um, it's all about photosynthesis. If you remember, maybe back in biology, you had in junior high or middle school, 
it's photosynthesis or these green plants taking in sunlight and water and then they produce it's actually a byproduct of photosynthesis is producing oxygen so as they get that sunlight they pull co2 carbon dioxide out of the water and out of the air and grow and they provide oxygen then for bacteria my little bacteria which would be microscopic and not really necessarily visible by the eye but uh, and, and feed those oxygen and those provide treatment um, <clears throat> at nighttime the the uh, process reverses and it actually pulls oxygen out of the pond and produces co2 which it puts in the pond and if you remember your chemistry co2 carbon dioxide is a weak acid and so if you're pulling acid out of the water then that means the pH is gonna go up. It's gonna become more basic. At night, if you're putting CO2 in the water, you're adding acid to it, so it's gonna drop it down. And so you get what's called this DO and pH diurnal fluctuation. It goes up and down depending on day or night. And so as you would expect, you know, when that sun's out really bright, by the end of the day, you've produced a whole lot of oxygen and it peaks out uh, because you're pulling CO2 out of the water, you've increased the pH, and it goes way up. But then as you start to have that sunset and you get right before dawn, you have these things peak out at uh, a low level because you're pulling oxygen out of the water and you're putting CO2 in. And I would suspect most of you who've worked with ponds before have seen them with pHs, <clears throat> if you take it in the afternoon, probably uh, up as high as 10 or a little more from those lagoons, but yet our secondary treatment rule requires that we be between six and nine. And so with that, I wanna see how many people have seen that. So Kristen, you wanna do the next poll? All right, get those answers in. I'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. And Mike, it looks like 73% of people said no, they have not seen lagoon effluent exceed 9.0, and 27% said yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm in the 27%, so maybe I make that 28%. <laughs> because we see it quite often in Kansas because we got a lot of tend to be a warm state uh, with a lot of sunny days but what the secondary treatment rule tells us and I kind of brought this up before and this is the actual text it said you have to maintain pH between six and nine unless the publicly owned treatment works can show that inorganic chemicals are not added to the waste stream as part of their treatment process or they don't have industries that add chemicals uh, to the treatment process that would cause the pH to be less than six or greater than nine. So uh, my caution always is if you're a POTW and you don't have industry and you're not altering the pH by chemical, you may not be subject to that pH treatment limit. And it may be, but it's, it's always up to you to request it. In Kansas, we saw it enough that we would begin to put a question out on the annual application that do you have uh, industries that add chemicals or do you add chemicals? And if they said no, then we could alter that pH limit for them. So again, uh, how do they work best? It's photosynthesis. Uh, most everything on a pond is external. There's a few things you can do, but not a whole lot to tweak the operation. You're kind of subject to your surroundings. So uh, they work better in higher temperature. If you've ever heard the rule of thumb, the biological activity doubles for every 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature. And what that means is that if you're at freezing, your biological activity is about one fourth of what it would be if you were at 68 degrees. 
Okay, you've got to have wind. Wind helps mix oxygen into the pond, so you don't want to inhibit the wind uh, blowing across that pond, and that means not having trees near the lagoon dikes, keeping weeds and grass, you know, mowed and and uh, the like. But uh, one of the issues with uh, having that wind blowing across there is it can cause excess erosion on your dikes. So you want to typically think about placing some riprap or some liners. Um, so our ideal conditions are sunlight and warm, but not too hot uh, with some wind. And this is just an example of liners that I like to see. This is a poured concrete liner on this pond. This is that riprap, that very large rock, in this case, limestone. And this is a plastic line lagoon where the plastic comes up over the top of the dike and gets anchored in. I uh, told you I'd tell you a little bit about lagoon performance. Let's focus on the blue line. This is a study that I had done. And what the blue line tells us is the average. And these were uh, like five facilities uh, in Kansas that we knew were designed and operated well. And we wanted to see what typical performance then should be. And so you actually have the highest value, lowest value, and then average. So let's focus on average. And what that would show us with BOD is it's, you know, if you look at overall throughout the year, it's doing typically less than 20 milligrams per liter. It's going to be higher in the wintertime because, again, of that slowdown of biological activity. Ammonia, which has become a real issue with lagoons, actually does some pretty good treatment. Uh, it comes into your facility at probably 30 to 40 milligrams per liter. So what we're seeing on average is it's anywhere from down to about two and a half to, you know, or at the most to down to really just tenths, you know, a fraction of a milligram per liter. So uh, it is an issue, but overall throughout the year, it does pretty good treatment. I told you nutrients were pretty good. I've got phosphorus, you know, we would probably love if all of our mechanical plants today put out phosphorus of, you know, less than one and a half milligrams per liter. It would certainly improve the water quality in the U.S. Uh, same way with total nitrogen. We look at a lagoon with total nitrogen and it's it's almost a well-operated and maintained one is uh, almost always less than 10. That again would be uh, really desired of a lot of our mechanical type treatment plants today. Aerated lagoons will remove 95% or so of BOD. So that means if you got 200 milligrams per liter of BOD coming in, you can expect an effluent of around 10. Solids, 20 to 60, but it's really dependent on how much settling you have in your basin size and type. Ammonia, you can get up to 95% in the warmer months, but that's kind of unpredictable. And you get little to none in colder weather. Again, that slowdown in colder weather causes a problem. Phosphorus, uh, you're typically only talking about a 25% reduction with those lagoons. So what does it all mean to me? Well, we get good treatment if they're well designed and operated. Uh, you know, lagoons can be built and operated at fairly low cost, uh, very low energy costs, and, and pretty simple operation. And for smaller communities with lagoons, it really may be the only affordable treatment. And I'll show you something on that here in a minute. But with all of this, I asked that question that I started with, do lagoons have a future? A lot of people are saying, hey, they can't meet ammonia limits. Then, you know, boom, make them, make them put in something that can. And the problem with that is, is that it uh, uh, may not always be able to afford that. It just may not be something that's workable. And it's particularly in communities with lower incomes. And so I show you this graph. This again came out of this EPA study. And if you look at the blue dots out here, this is a state median household income for each of these states that are lined up over here. The red dots are the median household incomes of communities with lagoons. And so you look at Georgia here with, uh, you know, showing. 69 lagoons, I don't know, may have more, may have less, but it's almost a $20,000 a year difference in median income in those towns. And that 
that kind of an income for a small town, it's going to be really difficult to put in a mechanical plant to be able to operate it. Um, you know, when they're properly operated, maintained, they'll work great. You know, just make sure you don't have short circuiting, operate series or parallel when it's called for. Uh, you can look at controlled discharge. You want to make sure you keep an eye on your sludge depth so you can keep those desludged and regularly mow and maintain dikes and liners. And sure, your aeration equipment's operating well and maintaining all your pumping equipment. I also believe they have a future if permittees are willing to look at affordable improvements. You know, it's can you go non-discharge? Remember we talked about if you could reuse water, evaporation, seepage could could balance out. And maybe you could get that if you built an additional cell onto your pond or put in a wetland. There's also some add-on, what I'd call add-on or add-in technologies. Add-in, you know, we've talked about the curtains and how those could reduce short circuiting. There's also what's called fixed film media, and that's generally something to let bacteria grow on it and keep it in place, and you'll certainly get better uh, nitrogen removal, ammonia, uh, nitrate, and the like, if you can get that. Here's an example of one. Uh, some, I think the company calls them biodomes, and other people call them poo glues. Uh, they look like a little igloo, and inside they've got this fixed film media that uh, grow uh, bacteria on and hold in place. In an aerated lagoon, some people have tried suspending uh, little plastic media like this, and you can see the bacteria growing on it. It stays in place, and that fixed uh, bacteria tends to uh, be a little more stable, uh, provide nitrifiers that will uh, reduce ammonia a little bit better. And then for add-on treatments, which can get quite a bit more expensive, uh, there's fixed media that's either above or below ground. Some people you'll see uh, bury this rock below ground to have something for the bacteria to grow on and pump air into that. There's filters and other kinds of filtration. I think that EPA believes lagoons have a future too. This is something that a lot of states that work with EPA on is that you can't just say get rid of them because for small towns, it may be the only thing that can be affordable. And so they state, you know, right here in their action plan that lagoons can provide cost-effective, low, ma low maintenance, energy efficient, reliable wastewater treatment. And the whole part of this, which I had a little, little bit of a hand in, not a lot, is trying to do some things to look at what some of these new technologies would might be and how we might be able to help lagoons move along into the future. But good uh, operation and maintenance practices are on the cities and the operators to keep things, you know, in good shape. Um, so, you know, the first thing, again, de-sludge or you're going to lose volume. You can typically look if you're measuring sludge depth in your lagoon. When it gets to be greater than 18 inches deep, you probably got a 25% loss and be able to be ready to de-sludge. And that's not an easy process. It's not a cheap process. But here's a couple of examples. Maybe you can see sludge being transferred from one cell to another. That's obviously they've let the sludge get way too high in that lagoon. If you can see it transferring from one cell to another, or if you see it building up in a little island, that's too much. And then you got to dewater that lagoon, let it dry out and then get in you know this case they're using a dozer and they're pushing all that sludge over to one one side where then they pick it up and go land dispose it you got to keep your dikes maintained this example of erosion they piled a bunch of rock in here to try to stop it this is the back end of that dike over here looks like they let trees grow in it and everything else that just disrupted the the integrity of that dike and allowed it to fail. Uh, that's an expensive fix. You got to mow and cut down trees. And this is an example of two bad things. They got trees growing right up here, which is blocking the wind. They got really high grass and weeds growing around the edge of the lagoon. And you can see how perfectly still it is. You don't see a ripple on this lagoon from any kind of wind movement. Um, same lagoon also then decided they were going to try to start getting rid of some of this stuff 
around and they had to get uh, or they had to get a licensed pesticide applicator to put down pesticide and you can see they they did a little work on one corner and you can see this riprap that used to be there uh, before they had that. Um, aeration, uh, you need to keep your aeration equipment going. Um, I'm just gonna turn that off. You can see this is supposed to be a fully aerated first cell. See the little pinpoints there? That means that aerator's not working. And if you can't see it, then that's that's all the ones that are not working in that particular facility, and that's certainly not a good thing. Um, again, I talked about this mode of operation series or parallel series. Operation is when you go first cell, second cell, third cell, and discharge. You typically do that in the summer because it's hot, things are really cooking, the bacteria are working well, the algae is working well. So you just need to put it into this first cell, second cell can do a little treatment, and settling and third cell treats. Now, if you get to the winter time though, and that, that you, and you've slowed down and you've slowed down to the point that um, uh, you know, you, you've lost a lot of your treatment capacity, then one option you have is to apply the wastewater over both what was cell one and two and make these both become the primary cell. That means then you've distributed that load, that same amount of load coming in over twice the volume. So you may get better treatment with that, but you need to remember uh, then when weather warms up to go back to series operation. And you also ought to work on reducing I and I to uh, improve detention time. You know, if you can reduce the flow coming in, that also gives you more detention. Forgot I was gonna show you one thing here on the D sludge. There's a link if you download the slides. This is a, a uh, Excel spreadsheet I put together to calculate uh, detention loss in a lagoon. Um, a lagoon is really what's called an obelisk because if you remember, we have those sloped sides on every side. So it's not a rectangle for calculating volume. That's the formula. If you don't have that at the tip of your tongue, you could use the spreadsheet then to uh, to calculate that. And with that, that's what I've got. And like I told you, I'm really pro lagoon and I like to see people operate them well. And I think they are really needed for small communities and, and hope they stay around. And Kristen, any questions? Then I'll be happy to try to answer. Awesome, we did have a couple of questions that came in. Um, First one is, what do you consider cooler weather in Fahrenheit? Cooler weather in Fahrenheit is down to about 40 degrees um, air temperature. Um, you have to remember though, wastewater will come in at, at 60 degrees, even in those wintertime temperatures. So it, it does come in warm, but as it stays in that pond for 120 days, it's obviously gonna come close to ambient temperature. Great, and the next question is, our activated sludge treatment plant has some abandoned lagoons that we are considering using for side stream treatment of high nutrient belt press sludge filtrate. Have you seen this type of reuse? Yes, yeah, uh, a number of people are looking, you know, at doing, actually doing it, it depends on, uh, what type of, of process you're gonna put in those lagoons. It's uh, just by themselves. I, I don't think you're gonna necessarily drop the nutrients that much, uh, but there could be some other processes added, uh, probably aerating, and uh, you'd probably wanna then look at some uh, return lines to the to the head of your process after uh, you treat that side stream. And then this next question we received at the beginning of the webinar, someone said that they have never heard of a non-discharging lagoon and they want to know what the typical permitting requirements are for that. Yeah, uh, and, and that can tend to be where you're at, you can kind of look at uh, rain charts across the US. And so I'm in a state where basically from the middle of the state to the west, um, 
evaporation exceeds rainfall every year. So it's almost like there's no excuse to discharge if you can get that. And that's through a lot of the central plains and on out west, you have that. Um, and you know, then in other places though, you can do it. What a lot of people do then is irrigate. And if that's, you know, irrigating crops, like I said, golf courses, what have you, if you can hold it and do it. So a state, uh, what I tend to see uh, from the states I've worked in is there'll be a state permit and rather than having effluent limits because you're not, there's really nothing to gauge them against, you're not discharging into water, you're going into to, uh, farmland or a golf course where a lot of nutrient is a good thing, you know, you want to see that. So the permits tend to be more just operational uh, as to how to operate and maintain that lagoon so that you keep it non-discharge. And again, if uh, you are using it, particularly on public lands, uh, I would always like to see requirements for how uh, the, the end user of that water, you know, notifies the public that reused wastewater is being used. It's, you know, more of a bacteriological pathologic path, pathogen, not pathological, pathogen issue uh, with those. And so you want to just be sure to alert people that you are using that and they should use caution, you know, if they're getting their hands in the water or grass on a golf course, what have you, that um, they uh, don't put it in their mouth, you know, maybe carry a little sanitizer with them and, and wipe their hands down. But when you're using it for crops, you know, non-primary uh, or crops that aren't directly consumed, like corn, soybeans, and those types of things that yet generally isn't considered public access. And there typically isn't a requirement to further disinfect that before it's applied. But that's the kind of things I would look for uh, in a state permit is just more operationally, how do you handle it? Uh, and uh, uh, make sure that you don't discharge to the surface. And for the water that is reused, you, you put adequate cautions on there so the public isn't, isn't harmed. And we have a couple more questions that came in if you have the time, Mike. I've got plenty of time, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, the next question is typically do states uh, require some type of permit to handle or store sewage sludge from lagoons? Uh, yeah, you do. You, you're you subject to what's called Part 503 of the uh, federal regulation or the Federal Clean Water Act, which is sludge disposal, and you typically need to meet all those same requirements that any mechanical plant would meet. Uh, in Kansas, though, we found after doing enough desludgings that that sludge is really pretty inert that's coming out of those lagoons. If it's set there for, you know, 20 years plus, uh, you can generally, we let people assume, you know, a fairly high uh, nitrogen content and then base their land application on uh, that higher nitrogen assumed content without having to go through all of the analyses. But that would be up to your state and how that's done. But yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll still be subject to the 503 regulations for sludge. And during the warmer months, um, this person's lagoon does drop below permitted levels. Does that mean that they should increase their detention time? In the warmer months, uh, I wish I knew what what it was, what parameter it was. Does it happen to say? Because there's one thing I did not not point out on my slides, uh, Kristen. That's that's a real kind of an interesting anomaly uh, that we see. I probably should have pointed out here is that you see ammonia jumped up here in the summertime, you know, like August. And what we believe we've figured out, and I've only seen one other author who's kind of come up with the explanation, 
is that it gets so hot that the anaerobic activity at the bottom of the lagoon uh, is really processing that sludge. And as the person mentioned about doing side stream treatment for activated sludge, is that when you're decomposing that sludge, you tend to release a lot of ammonia. And that may be what's going on uh, in that lagoon. Uh, that's very at that time. So it, it, would you yeah. so would you then recommend increasing the detention time for them? Uh, you know, you you could. I'm not sure how you're going to increase it unless you build another cell um, on that, uh, and that cell is probably ultimately going to come up to the same kind of temperatures if you have hot summers, and also begin releasing that uh, ammonia. This person sent in another message. They said that the lagoon had a DO of 10 last month and 4.4 yesterday. Uh -huh. You bet. I'd be interested to know what times a day you did because, you know, what you're seeing here, let me go back to this slide, is remember I said the dissolved oxygen um, it can go up very high. It can go, I, usually in my part of the world, 12 will be saturated. You can see super saturated, like maybe up to 14 milligrams per liter of oxygen. That's because of all that sunlight. And if there's a lot of algae in your pond, it's just cranking the oxygen out and it's storing up. Uh, what you might have then is a few days of cloudiness uh, or cooler weather than where you don't see those higher temperatures. But uh, it's really interesting if you have a DO probe, if you can do it or, or however you do your sample collection and look at it is go out, you know, if you want to get up early, you know, around breakfast time, go out and take a sample and then take one in the afternoon and you'll probably see them vastly different uh, due to that. DO production from the algae. Yeah, someone else messaged in and said that the ammonia release from the sludge is called benthic feedback and that they need to mm -hmm. remove the sludge and aerate or mix the sludge. Yeah, uh, that's, I, I agree with that partially, but if you're only at about, you know, a, a foot of sludge, and uh, it, it's an expensive proposition to get people to mobilize, to come out and remove sludge. So we tend to try to look at, you know, about a 25% loss in detention is when it would drive it. If you had to remove it at, at shorter intervals, it's gonna be pretty costly to do that uh, on those short intervals. All right, and then the last question is, is it common for groundwater contamination to be an issue with lagoons where you have a high water table and or sandy soil? You know, not really. Um, I actually did some work on this in college as in graduate school and looked at, um, we actually were able to get samples from below the, the liners and look at them. For the most part, no, uh, it can, what you tend to see is more of the, the nitrogen components. And you can, if you get uh, into the groundwater and you, it tends to be more ammonia going through, can convert to nitrate and you can begin to see some nitrate build up under those lagoons, which, then of course is an issue if that uh, goes into a drinking water, source water. But for the most part, no, you really don't. As long as you're pretty much a small town that just has residences connected to the lagoon and no industry with, you know, no real high loads uh, of industrial type waste coming in, you don't tend to see a lot under those lagoons. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, just so everyone knows, following this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email with the slides from today and a link to this recording.
we also ask that you complete the webinar evaluation following the webinar so you can let us know what your thoughts on today's session are. This helps us plan future webinars on topics that are important to you. Thank you again, everyone. Um, we hope to see you at future EFCN events. Thank you, Mike. You bet.